This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Six policemen and seven militants killed in attacks on three checkpoints in Egypt's Sinai region. UN Refugee Agency says influx of DRC refugees stretching resources in Uganda. And Iran's Atomic Energy Organization says the country will speed up uranium enrichment as tensions continue with the United States. Hello and welcome to CGTN. This is Africa Live and I'm Karen Roberts in Nairobi. Also coming up in the program. In business, President Amangagwe defends the decision to end a multi-currency regime in Zimbabwe. And in sport, Nigeria Africa Cup of Nations camp disrupted following protest over unpaid dues. News just in from Egypt indicate that at least six police officers have been killed after militants attacked three police checkpoints. Reports say seven of the attackers were also killed in the shootout with police. The three attacks happened at a location called Al Arish City in the north of Sinai. Police say they are in pursuit of the perpetrators. We'll keep you updated as soon as we get more information on that. Well, still in Egypt, authorities have raided 19 businesses allegedly tied to the Muslim Brotherhood. The businesses were accused of funding a plot to overthrow the state and its institutions. $15 million were seized during the raid, according to the Interior Ministry. At least eight people were arrested. They include journalists, political figures and a prominent human rights lawyer. Amnesty International slammed the arrest, calling them chilling. Well, let's get you more from CGTN's Yasser Hakim, who is in Cairo for us. Yasser, what more can you tell us, first of all, about these attacks in Sinai and the raids on businesses allegedly tied to the Muslim Brotherhood? Yes, the attacks in, uh, were uh, southwest of Al Arish in northern Sinai, close to the borders with Gaza and uh, they were uh, targeting uh, the police uh, stations there, uh, or three of them, and uh, those attacks were met with uh, uh, resistance from the police uh, in which uh, they have killed uh, the assailants. Uh, and also, uh, at the same time, uh, they, they, one of the uh, terrorists had uh, died uh, from a uh, explosive belt uh, that he triggered uh, once uh, the attack uh, happened. Uh, at, at the moment, what we know is that the police forces and the army are uh, trying to uh, locate uh, the rest of the assailants who have uh, fled uh, into the desert. And uh, we are waiting for any news on whether they have been uh, arrested or not in the next few hours. Uh, the forces say they, they are close uh, to arresting uh, those assailants. Okay, thank you very much, Yasser. Yes, we'll have to leave it there for now. That was CGTN's Yasser Hakim there in Cairo for us. Moving on to other news now, tensions between Washington and Tehran continue to rise. A spokesperson for Iran's Atomic Energy Organization says the country will speed up uranium enrichment, but Iranian President Hassan Rouhani today stressed that his country never seeks war with Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump earlier threatened to obliterate parts of Iran if it attacked anything American. CGTN's Jim Spellman reports now from the White House. The rhetoric heating up between Tehran and Washington with the Iranian President Hassan Rouhani saying the White House suffers from a quote mental disability and questioning this mixed U.S. message where on one hand President Trump says he wants new negotiations while on the other hand placing intense sanctions on top Iranian leadership. The White House actions mean it is stricken by a mental disability. We started the reduction of our obligations, and of course, the Americans are very angry about this. Why are they angry? Weren't they the ones that said the nuclear agreement is a bad deal? 
President Trump hit back on Twitter, calling Rouhani's comments, quote, ignorant and insulting and accusing the Iranian leadership of supporting terrorism while insisting he wants direct talks to forge a new nuclear deal. It's too bad this is happening. They're living badly right now. Their country's not doing well economically at all. That can be changed very quickly, very easily. But they have to get rid of the hostility from the leadership. The leadership, I hope they stay. I hope they do a great job. But uh, they should talk to us decently. We're, uh, we're all for them. We want it to be done properly. Iran says it won't enter into new negotiations with these intense U.S. sanctions in place. It's not at all clear what the next step is here, but this is sure to be a topic at the G20 summit later this week. Jim Spellman, CGTN, at the White House. The U.S.-led conference to promote economic peace in the Middle East region is underway in Bahrain without the participation of either Israel or Palestine. The leader of the Hamas Islamic movement has rejected Donald Trump's plan. Ishmael Haniye says Palestine is not for sale. He was speaking during a national conference in Gaza on Tuesday. The rival Palestinian Authority has also repeatedly called for the boycott of the two-day Bahrain meeting. Palestinians say an economic component can't preempt a political statement. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is leading the conference, which the White House touts as the deal of the century. It's been billed as the first part of Washington's long-delayed broader political blueprint to revive the Israeli-Palestinian peace process to be unveiled at a later date. South Korean President Moon Jae-in says the United States is in talks with the DPRK over a possible third summit between the two leaders. Although negotiations between President Donald Trump and the DPRK leader Kim Jong-un broke down earlier this year, Moon said there was no reason to talk of a stalemate. He said both sides wanted a working-level dialogue. Moon is set to host Trump this weekend following the G20 summit in Japan. U.S. officials said the American president had no plans to meet Kim during the trip and declined to comment on whether he would visit the demilitarized zone as previously planned. Meanwhile, China says that it encourages dialogue between the U.S. and the DPRK. Our position is consistent that the U.S. and the DPRK should keep their momentum of dialogue and contact and meet each other halfway. The two sides should show goodwill and resolve their differences through dialogue. China is willing to work with the two sides and other concerned parties to push forward the political settlement of the Korean Peninsula issue. Today is International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. A global report by the UN Office of Drugs and Crime indicates that opioid addiction is on the rise and that a tramadol crisis is emerging in parts of Africa. Tramadol is a synthetic opioid which the report says is being illegally manufactured in South Asia and then trafficked to the African continent. Global seizures of tramadol has surged exponentially from less than 10 kilos in 2010 to almost 125 tons in 2017. The report suggests that the problem is particularly severe in West, Central and North Africa. Several West African countries have reported that after cannabis, tramadol is one of the most widely used drugs for non-medical purposes. The report says that many consume the drug for its calming analgesic and anti-fatigue effects. Well, we are now joined by CGTN's Phil Ehaza, who is in Abuja in Nigeria for us. Phil, Nigeria is one of the West African countries mentioned in this UN drug report as struggling under the weight of drug abuse. How bad is the situation in Nigeria? Well, thank you, Karen. Um, you know, looking at the report, the UN report there, you would find that uh, two countries majorly influence the uh, UN report, that's Nigeria and India, and they are significant countries in the two continents, Asia and Africa. Uh, Nigeria's population is almost 3% of the world population, and India is about 17% of the world population. Uh, one major thing that we'll consider is gathering uh, data from those countries. It's a huge task. But, you know, 
um, before 2018, the, the drug abuse issue has been treated uh, or has been in the, in the fr front burner of issues in the country until several investigative reports were done in the media, local and foreign, uh, including uh, clamors by health experts, as well as, um, you know, some uh, lawmakers, Nigerian lawmakers in May 2018, coming up with figures, disturbing figures of um, about 3 million uh, bottles of codeine, uh, co Codeine, which is in, in cough syrup, consumed daily by uh, you know youths, young people in three states, northern states in the country. So, uh, but up until that time, uh, Nigeria could not really ascertain how huge the problem is. But indeed, it is huge. Uh, of course, uh, the, the government has eventually banned uh, codeine, tramadol, and some of these um, uh, you know substances that are considered as. Um, uh, you know, drug abuse uh, when used, uh, you know, illicitly by young people in the country. And uh, Phil, what are the factors involved in this abuse of opioids like tramadol and fentanyl? Well, if you look at the kind of people that consume it, uh, you also um, have to take into consideration that Nigeria is dealing with the range of issues, uh, poverty, uh, economic um, you know, struggles and all that. For example, Nigeria is dealing with the highest number of extremely poor people. Uh, you know, if you, if you check, uh, health experts have said that social pathologies like um, unemployment, uh, parental deprivation, uh, stress, depression, um, you know, uh, social um, pressure, peer pressure from uh, peer groups, uh, you know, the urge or crave to, you know, succeed in life in terms of uh, getting reach or, um, you know, g gathering material wealth, especially in a society that is now materialistic in, 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 in that sense. So many of the youth or young people, uh, they, they tend to take these substances to douse the tension, the stress and depression that they face, especially if they're struggling up the ladder to make it in society. These are some of the factors that you know, move a lot of young people uh, to uh, ab abusing drugs in the society. So Phil, you, you've mentioned all these issues that are contributing to this problem. What measures can be seen on the ground to deal with this problem? Well, there's been uh, quite a number of measures taken by the government, especially uh, as at this time, 2018, when uh, you know these um, substances, uh, opioids like uh, codeine and tramadol, were banned uh, by the government. There is an agency, uh, the NDLEA, that's a National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, that has um, also you know um, upped its efforts to see how they can you know break the syndicate of illicit drug trafficking in nigeria because it's uh, not just uh, a problem in nigeria it's a syndicate so it involves um you know multinational pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceuticals uh, you're talking about um, production from outside the country how it gets into the country and all of that uh, so there's also a sister agency um, called the uh, NAFDAC, the National Agency for Food, Drug Administration and Control, which, um, as at this time last year, commenced a training of about 20,000 young people, uh, you know, uh, in the health sector to see how that they can also gather data, they can sensitize uh, the population how not to abuse these drugs. But experts have said that more needs to be done, considering the huge uh, problem that the country is faced with. Uh, you know, set up data data centers, set up um, you know health centers that would ensure uh, recovery, full recovery of people that have already fallen into it and then also sensitize more of the pop populace on how that they should uh, stay away from uh, taking these substances. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, that was CGTN's Phil, Iha Phil Ihaza there in Abuja in Nigeria for us following the drug problem there. Moving on to other news now, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency, around 7,500 refugees from the Democratic Republic of Congo have arrived in Uganda. Thousands have crossed the border since the start of June. The influx is placing a strain on already overstretched assistance facilities. Clashes between the Hema and the Lendu communities have led to 300 people crossing the border every day. The conflict has displaced around 30,000 people in the DRC. My village in Yamamba was attacked and our house was one of the ones burnt down. I escaped the attack with my husband and our six-month-year-old daughter, Naomi. We have been sleeping in the bushes for safety ever since the village was attacked with nothing to eat. 
until we crossed into Uganda, where we were received. For the first time in a very long time, we slept under a shelter and had a meal. In two weeks' time, South Sudan will celebrate its eighth year as an independent nation. UN Special Representative for the Secretary General in South Sudan, David Shearer, touched on the country's progress following the latest peace deal, as well as the delay in forming a unity government. The drop-off in political violence based on the trend of past years has meant hundreds if not thousands of people are alive who would otherwise not be. Many displaced families have decided it is safe and time to return to their homes. In two weeks, South Sudan will celebrate its eighth anniversary of gaining its independence. With that sovereignty comes responsibility, an obligation that is acknowledged only rarely, including for leaders to use the country's resources in the best interests of their citizens and not their own. The message from the people of South Sudan that we have heard in that regard is very clear. Live up to your responsibility and give us peace. We are going to a short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... Massive vaccination exercise begins in Somalia against polio and cholera. And expansion of slums in Abuja threatens government efforts to turn Abuja into a world-renowned megacity. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. I'm Penina Karibe in the heart of Nairobi, which is vastly... From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Iraq is in talks with the United Nations over whether it can prosecute foreign ISIL fighters currently held in Syria. There are thousands of fighters held in detention camps in northeastern Syria. We do not prosecute foreigners who did not fight in Iraq. We prosecute foreigners who fought in Iraq and committed crimes in Iraq, just like in any other country where a crime takes place in its territory. They will be prosecuted regardless of their nationality. If it is a crime or terrorism crime, or any other crime, we prosecute those according to this law. But about the foreigners who are fighting in Syria or elsewhere, we are still discussing their case, and we give our suggestions to the United Nations and to all the countries, and we are still discussing the case. China and Angola have agreed to enhance cooperation in various fields. It follows the visit by Vice Chairman of China's Central Military Commission, to Xi Chiliang to Angola, where he met with Angolan President Zhao Manuel Lorenzo. Xu said that China is willing to work with Angola to expand areas of cooperation. President Lorenzo also expressed commitment to work with China. The two countries have maintained great relations over the past decades. Exchanges and cooperation between the two armies have steadily advanced. The Angolan president also visited China twice last year, where he met Chinese President Xi Jinping. The two leaders agreed to deepen political trust and bilateral cooperation. A major vaccination campaign is taking place across Somalia, targeting close to 2 million people. Health agencies have launched a campaign to vaccinate against polio and cholera. CG10's Abdulaziz Bilo has more. A new round of vaccination campaign against polio has kicked off in Puntland and Somaliland regions after 15 children were paralyzed due to the polio viruses north of the country. 
The UN's World Health Organization, in conjunction with UNICEF, say they now hope to target close to a million children as the two regions experience outbreaks of two strains of poliovirus. The latest announcement comes less than two years after Mogadishu and partner agencies announced a major milestone in the eradication of polio after the last case was recorded in 2014. Meanwhile, a major campaign against cholera is underway in southern Somalia, including the capital Mogadishu, after health officials recorded more than a thousand cases since the beginning of 2019. The UN's World Health Organization says that the latest oral vaccine campaign against cholera in Somalia is the biggest in the African continent and hopes to target close to 650,000 vulnerable people aged one year and above to eliminate the risk of the disease among vulnerable populations and to prevent recurring cholera outbreaks in the country. This is a good vaccine. I have brought 10 children and grandchildren here to receive it. It is very important for every household to receive this vaccine to avoid any outbreaks. Hamar Jajab is one of the areas affected because of its slum area and the densely populated areas. We hope to target an estimated 100,000 people in the coming three days. We have received a lot of adults and children here due to the support from the local authorities. Authorities say lessons have been learned after more than a thousand people died from a major cholera outbreak in 2017. Mobile teams have since been deployed to ensure each household is immunized and sensitized on the importance of early vaccination. Due to a recent change in climate, we are concerned about the emergence of cholera and acute water diarrhea. That's why we began sensitizing locals on the importance of cleanliness and vaccination. Without awareness and sensitization, we wouldn't have achieved anything. Authorities say in the past, public mistrust of vaccines frustrated government's efforts of eradicating preventable diseases. But that has since changed following a coordinated sensitization campaign on various media platforms. However, aid agencies will not be able to reach areas under militant control, further worsening the livelihood of thousands of children under the age of five. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. There's a growing number of slums in the Nigerian capital, which is threatening the government's efforts to turn it into a world-renowned megacity. Abuja is home to over three million residents and now faces the challenge of managing its informal settlement. CGTN's correspondent Filihaza now reports. Joseph Eneji recently left school and now works as an office cleaner in Abuja. When the day is done, he takes a five-minute walk back to this settlement. I live in this kind of house because it's close to my workplace. I will not pay, pay transport to get to work so that I can be able to pay to save money from my monthly pay to survive. Abuja, like other capital cities in the world, have choice buildings like this. But beside almost every of these buildings in the city are shanty settlements mainly occupied by artisans and the underprivileged who have now become unwelcome neighbors. According to the United Nations, Abuja is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. However, an inadequate but expensive housing supply has led to the emergence of slums. The government accuses people who live in these areas of damaging the look of the city. It also says the slums offer places for criminals to hide. But people are still leaving the countryside for the city. The reason we have shanty homes in cities uh, basically is because people want to enjoy you know, the facilities, the infrastructure, the sites, the services, the way we have them in the cities. You know, these are you know, amenities that usually should also go to rural areas, but they can't find them there. There's a strong correlation between a, an increase in shanties and slums with urban rural migration. In 2007, the government started demolishing shanty settlements to try and stick to its ambition for Abuja of becoming an ultra-modern city. That pushed most of the slums to the outskirts, but 12 years on, they returned to the city center. The master plan should be reviewed in a way that the impoverished in the society can access, you know, good life. Resettling this, you know, the dwellers of these um, slums and shanties into, I mean, to a place where they can find the basic amenities. If you do that, 
you are sort of reducing the over-dependence on the already existing infrastructure that we have in the city that's been planned for. For now, people like Joseph struggle each day not just to make ends meet, but also with the fear of the government demolishing their homes. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja, Nigeria. In London, a high-level conference of European museums is debating the mechanism for returning Africa's misappropriated art. It's estimated that 90% of Africa's cultural heritage lies outside the continent, plundered during colonial times. Included in a vast stockpile of priceless treasures in museums across Europe, are the unique Benin bronzes from Nigeria. The bronzes were forcibly taken by the British when invading the Benin Kingdom in 1897. European museums have been under mounting pressure to return the artifacts for decades. However, as Richard Bestick reports now from London, returning Africa's lost iconic artworks is complicated. You'd think it would be simple, wouldn't you? Artworks plundered during Europe's colonial age should be simply returned. Everyone benefits. Africa gets its irreplaceable art back and Europe's museums shared their colonial baggage. But it would appear it's not that simple. Our discussions here at the German Historical Institute in London, the second in a series, some of Europe and Africa's leading academic minds are working on exactly that. And the questions, though straightforward, have complicated answers. Experts here looking at what repatriation means for Europe's 500 museums, whether the repatriation of artworks naturally entails what they call the decolonizing of museums, or whether it'll actually prevent that process. First, though, the experts gathered here will be working on the very meaning of decolonization in museums. The positive view is that more than a century after many pieces were looted, the decades-old campaign for their return is finally looking like a real possibility. However, several major European institutions have yet to fully commit. Instead, as with the British Museum, among others, returning artefacts on long-term loans. Picking up the pieces from centuries of colonial adventurism would, it seems, be still mired in argument. What they're achieving here with their tasks, only the beginning of a long haul. Richard Bestick, CGTN, the German Historical Institute, London. All the business news coming up for you after the break, including... President Amangagwa defends the decision to end a multi-currency regime in Zimbabwe. And Kenya and Tanzania set a date to resolve a simmering trade dispute. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. We come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Zimbabwe's President Emerson Amangagwa has defended his government's decision to end a decade of multiple currency use in the country. Amangagwa has said that the plan is to repair the battered economy and to attract investments that will bolster growth. On Monday, the government announced that the interim RTG dollar 
will be the only legal tender. Before the declaration, the multi-currency regime offered economic stability and control of the monetary policy. Inflation in Zimbabwe, which currently stands at 97.8%, has been attributed to the pricing of the US dollar. The soaring levels of unemployment and industrial action by labor unions have also frustrated economic growth. Kenya and Tanzania have agreed to hold a forum in July to end the prolonged trade dispute between them. The long-standing trade disputes have resulted in low intra-regional trade as businesses accrue massive losses. Tanzania is considered a top destination for Kenyan exports, which are worth 279 million dollars. However, it introduced a 25% import levy on confectionery imports from Kenya in 2018. In April, representatives from the two countries met in Arusha to resolve the disagreements during the fourth bilateral meeting. Government officials and stakeholders from both countries will now hold a forum in Mombasa to thrash out an amicable agreement. Trade within the East Africa community stands at 20%, which is relatively lower compared to other trade blocks in Africa. South Africa's state-owned companies have been billed as in a near state of collapse. Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon has warned that the government may take them over unless the boards and management ensure proper governance and financial management. Gordon has asked the state firm's management and boards to stabilize finances and to end dependency on government bailouts. The country's biggest state-owned entities, ESCOM, Transnet, Denel and South African Airways, have been rocked by mismanagement and ineffective allocation of resources that has led to massive losses. The minister has hinted of plans to introduce a strategic investor to bail out the national carrier, South African Airways. In the meantime, the outlook for the South African economy for 2019 following the latest report of the GDP points to a country's economy that's under extreme stress. Inflation is accelerating, placing pressure on the central bank to rethink on interest rates when it next sits in July. Angela Coppola has more. There are also global themes that are affecting South Africa, including the trade tensions between China and the U.S., which are adding to the country's economic woes. So imagine South Africa is a long-distance runner. It's already falling face flat. But this is a marathon, not a sprint. I expect the South African economy, South African Reserve Bank, to suggest a potential rate cut, but this will be contingent on what the Federal Reserve does in July. South Africa is a small open economy, easily and heavily influenced by currency moves and also by the availability of capital flowing into and out of the country. There's also the export footprint. That export uh, cluster is dominated by uh, resources and commodities. So that leaves South Africa not only heavily exposed, but also heavily reliant on the, the mood and sentiment in the world economy at large. Internationally, there's a new trend that's emerging and it could work in South Africa's favour. I think there's a new key thick global theme that everyone's talking about right now and it's how central banks are all coming together to suggest a potential stimulus measures to counter a global slowdown. Now, should this become reality, this is going to positively impact global risk sentiment and naturally positively push the rand which is an emerging market currency. The world is also watching what happens between China and the United States. The silver line I'll be looking at, of course, will be trade developments. We all know how trade developments are played out. There's a lot of optimism over both sides securing a trade deal, only for investors to be left empty-handed. The G20 meeting is quite significant. While it's unexpected that both sides are going to secure a trade deal, a market-friendly outcome will be a situation where the United States and China agree to restart trade talks. This will open path for central banks across the globe to continue with stimulus measures, which will naturally positive push risk sentiment higher. Global sentiment remains muted, with Brexit and the China-US trade war front of mind. I also suspect that fast forward a year, we will have found resolution in Brexit, and we will have found an improvement, a thawing, uh, in the Trump-China relationship. It's a tough business environment at the moment, and it's a question of whether those silver linings are going to come through sooner rather than later. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa.
A group of Chinese investors are visiting Tunisia this week to sign agreements in several fields. The visit comes on the occasion of the Tunisia Investment Forum. Tunisia aims to boost Chinese investment and to become a platform for the export of Chinese products to Africa and Europe. Tunisia Foreign Investment Promotion Agency, FIPA, has signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the China International Investment Promotion Agency, aiming to establish an institutional framework to share information on investment. The agreement with the Chinese side is very important. Tunisia's goal is to boost foreign direct investment. We are putting in place the legal framework to accompany Chinese investors and facilitate their work. The signing ceremony was attended by Minister of Development, Investment and International Cooperation, Ziad Laveri, FIPA Director General and the Ambassador of China to Tunisia. The Memorandum of Understanding is between the Tunisian FIPA and Chinese CIPA in the presence of the Minister of Investment. These two organizations' role is to promote investment. We hope to increase direct exchange between entrepreneurs on both sides and more Chinese investment in Tunisia. The Minister of Investment added that boosting Chinese investment in Tunisia will revive the economy in the North African state. We've discussed with His Excellency the Chinese Ambassador and the representative of the China International Investment Promotion Agency ways of boosting the Tunisia-China partnership in investment, the flow of capital and promoting Tunisia business opportunities in China. Tunisian officials have called on Chinese businessmen and companies to take advantage of Tunisia's privileged relations with sub-Saharan Africa and EU countries to forge partnerships with Tunisian businessmen and to open up to African and European markets. Foreign Affairs Minister Khmeiz Jhinawi stressed during his meeting with the Ambassador of China the Tunisian government's will to strengthen cooperation relations with Beijing, particularly in the field of major infrastructure projects. Jhinawi called on Chinese companies to make the most of the incentives offered by the new investment code for foreign investors. Admin Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. African bankers have put their weight behind the Nigerian government's microcredit scheme targeting millions of small businesses with interest-free loans. CGTN caught up with one of the beneficiaries to find out why the scheme is gaining high-level recognition. Mohamed Sani is an agro-produce trader in Utako Market in Abuja. He does not have enough capital to rent a space of his own in the market, so he shares it with another trader who deals in general merchandise. He started the business to cover basic needs of his family. His situation could improve with the introduction of the Trader Money Microcredit Scheme. After paying back the 10,000 Naira loan, you can apply to get a loan of 20,000 Naira. So I wanted to continue this way until we can get a loan of 100,000 Naira to help us improve the business. Trader Money is part of a government social intervention program. It supports small businesses that struggle to get credit due to high interest rates and collateral security requirements. The scheme offers continuous financing for displaced traders who pay back their loans within six months from the time of acquiring it. No one targeted at improving the scale of micro businesses in Nigeria in specific. And as such, when the initiative came up under the um, government um, enterprise and um, empowerment program as one of the um, social investments intervention of the federal government, we see the need to applaud that because it's a very good scheme. The federal government had a target to disperse 2 million trader money loans across the 36 states and FCT by the end of 2018. Up to 1.5 million people have since benefited from the scheme. The government now hopes to reach about 10 million traders and artisans by the end of 2023. Brian Toussaint, CGTN. Well, we are going to a short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... Malaysian authorities seize 5,000 smuggled turtles and arrest two Indian nationals in Kuala Lumpur Airport. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. 
the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Malaysian authorities have seized over 5,000 smuggled baby terrapins at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. They detained two Indian nationals arriving from Guangzhou in China last Thursday. Their combined illegal haul was worth almost $13,000. The red-eared sliders, a semi-aquatic species of turtle, were being kept in small baskets inside the men's luggage. They are the most popular turtle in the pet trade, but permits are required as young turtles may carry salmonella. Malaysia is a major transit point for wildlife trade to other Asian countries. An airport customs official says that the two men are expected to be charged and could face up to five years in jail. Two Indian nationals arrived from Guangzhou, China, via commercial flight. During inspection, a total of 2,620 baby red-eared slider terrapins in 16 baskets were found in the first individual's luggage. After the second individual's luggage was screened, another 2,635 terrapins of the same species worth $6,000 were found. Altogether, a total of 5,255 terrapins worth $12,000 were seized from these two individuals. This is the first such case in the year and we are unable to state whether it involves a similar quantity or more if compared to the previous cases. But it happens to be quite a large quantity in two suitcases found at the same time. Botswana is facing challenges with its wildlife. Botswana is home to almost one-third of Africa's elephants. Following continued attacks of humans uh, by the elephants, the government of Botswana has resolved to lift the hunting ban which was imposed in 2014. This comes after several people were killed by elephants this year across the country. CT10's Yulissa and Jamela has more. Conservationists estimate that Botswana has about 130,000 elephants, but some parliamentarians say the number is much higher and causes problems for mostly small-scale farmers. As a result of an increasing conflict between wildlife and humans, Botswana's president, Mukhoiti Masise, has lifted the ban on elephant hunting. The wildlife conflict is a commonly recurring issue and challenge. And yes, we've had policy interventions that were intended to protect our determination to conserve our flora and fauna, such as when in 2014 we imposed voluntarily on ourselves the ban on hunting of all species. It wasn't just of one or two or three species. It was a ban, self-imposed, voluntary, temporary, renewable every year. We felt we need to engage our people in open dialogue about this. Should we continue with the voluntary suspension of hunting or should we stop? In recent years, elephants have killed over 40 people. Here in Rakops village, yet another funeral is held. Villagers bury one of their own who was killed trying to chase away an elephant from his crops. So painful because I would say he was killed in the middle of town. Um, you can imagine how painful it is. The elephants are all over. This is not the first time we had 
uh, someone having trampled on by an elephant. We had uh, another incident not in a few uh, months ago in the same village here, but that took place in this area. So we are really having a serious problem of human wildlife conflict. The Department of Wildlife and National Parks say the elephant population grew nearly three times in the past few years, and now the animals are seeking food and water in villages and towns. The government is looking to find better solutions to the human wildlife conflict crisis, while communities are advocating for the culling of some elephants. It's a delicate balance between saving human lives and preserving Botswana's elephants. Yulisa Jamela for CGTN in Khaberone in Botswana. We have all the sports news coming up for you after the break, including... Nigeria Africa Cup of Nations camp disrupted following protests over unpaid dues.